Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood garage geek. And I was at a bookstore today and I found this lovely, lovely book. N.C. Wyeth is such a great artist. And so, seeing that tomorrow is Thanksgiving, or it's going to be today when I post this, I decided that I am going to read this to you. And as I'm reading, you'll get to experience the stunning art that this book has to offer. Enjoy! <laughs> N.C. Wyeth's Pilgrims, text by Robert San Suchi. The 16th and 17th centuries were a time of religious struggle in England. The rulers wanted their subjects to follow the established church, but some people had different beliefs. One such group, referred to as separatists, held secret meetings, but they grew afraid when some of their members were put in prison. They left England for Holland, but they could not settle comfortably among the Dutch. As time passed, they heard stories of a settlement in North America called Virginia. This new world promised land, economic opportunity, and, most importantly, the hope of religious freedom. So the separatists decided to cross the ocean and establish a colony of their own. They made an agreement with a group of London businessmen. The settlers would receive passage and supplies, and in return, they would send the London company fish, fur, and lumber for seven years. The separatists in Holland bought a ship, the Speedwell. Those in London hired another ship, the Mayflower. Even with two ships, many of the separatists were left behind with the hope of making the crossing later. Both ships set sail from Southampton, England, but twice the leaky Speedwell had to turn back. Each time the Mayflower followed her, and finally on September 6, 1620, the Mayflower alone departed from Plymouth, England on her historic voyage. While no pictures survive, researchers have reconstructed the Mayflower's appearance from documents and paintings of the time. Likely, she was a three-masted ship, 90 feet long, with a crew of 25 sailors. Of the 102 passengers crowded into the damp quarters, 49, 19 men, 11 women, and 14 children were separatists. The others had been recruited by the London Company. Referred to by the separatists as strangers, they did not entirely share the separatists' religious beliefs, but they did share a desire for a new life in a new land. These included Miles Standish, a professional soldier hired as the commander of the separatists' militia. There were also some hens, goats, and two dogs. Noise was a constant companion. Timbers creaked, sails and rigging flapped, rats scratched, and bilge water gurgled. At night, some 90 people slept in the area known as tween decks, most on straw mattresses on the hard floor. The stuffy space was also cluttered with chests, barrels of provisions, and building equipment. There was not a place on board where there was silence or solitude. The overcrowding taxed everyone and tensions ran high between the passengers and the sailors. The crew resented the separatists' daily psalm singing and prayers, while the pilgrims disliked the sailors' swearing. The pitch and roll of rough waves made seasickness a constant problem. For those passengers not too seasick to eat, most meals were simple. Salted meat or fish and hard, dry ship's biscuit. There were also dried peas and beans, dried fruits, cheese, and butter. The food was washed down with beer, which even the children drank. Lice, boredom, homesickness, and fear added to the misery. During the journey, a servant to the group's doctor died of a fever and was buried at sea. A boy was born and named Oceanus. The weather ranged from fair and gentle to raging storms. During one storm, the ship's main beam cracked. Some thought all was lost, but the ship rode out the storm and the beam was repaired with an iron screw that had been brought for house building. In the course of another storm, a passenger fell overboard, but managed to catch hold of a rope that was trailing in the water and was hauled back to safety. So it was a weary group that heard the first cries of land ho and crowded the railing for a look at their new home. For 66 days, they had been at sea, but on November 11th, 1620, their adventurous journey ended, or so they thought. In fact, many more adventures and dangers lay ahead.
From the deck of the ship, the passengers gazed at a bleak landscape. Some of the sailors muttered that the place was filled with wild beasts and wild men called Indians. A few of the passengers talked of returning to England, but most were determined to stay and soon began to discuss what to do next. Because they had landed so far from their intended goal, Virginia, the strangers felt that they should not have to honor their agreement with the London merchants, but the separatists argued that they should proceed as they had planned. Ultimately, the strangers agreed, and together, the two groups drafted an agreement known as the Mayflower Compact, which set out the principles that would govern their settlement. From this point, the groups became so intermingled that all have become known as pilgrims. The first exploring party left the ship on November 11th. They replenished their dwindling supplies of wood and water and marveled at the abundance to be found in their new homeland. On Monday, November 13th, a landing was made to repair the shallop, a small boat used for exploring. While the men repaired, the women washed clothes. Since there had been little chance to do more than rinse and salt water on the Mayflower, the washing took all day. Spread out to the air, that first wash day was a rainbow of clothes. Red skirts, blue pants, purple capes, and green stockings. Soon after, a second scouting party went out. On this trip, they found the remains of a hut with curious mounds nearby. Digging into the mounds, the explorers found baskets filled with corn. They named this place Corn Hill and brought 40 bushels of corn back to the ship, promising themselves to make payment later, which they eventually did. To the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower, the strange, multicolored corn must have seen a fortunate sign indeed. With enough seed corn to plant in the spring, they now felt more hopeful about their prospects. But winter winds and icy rains soon drove all but the hardiest sailors below deck. Men returning from runs to shore reported the ground was covered with snow. The need to find a place for their colony grew more urgent than ever. For many, the situation must have seemed little better than when they were on the high seas. They wondered if they were ever going to find the right spot to build their new home. Many more scouting parties went out, including one that ventured out into the shallop in mid-December. One night during this trip, while camped on shore, they heard a strange cry. Frightened and confused, the men fired their muskets in all directions and the noise stopped. They assured themselves that they had heard only the cry of wolves, but sleep did not come easily. Early the next morning, they heard the cry again. The pilgrims retreated, firing two shots. The Indians, still at a distance, continued their cries. They shot a few arrows at the pilgrims and then fled. Though the barricade bristled with arrows, miraculously no one, Indian or pilgrim, had been wounded. The pilgrims gathered the arrows, which were eventually sent back to England as curiosities, and continued their explorations. They named the site First Encounter. On Friday, December 9, the pilgrims discovered a small cove. The following Monday, they sounded the waters and found them deep enough to harbor large ships. Then they moored the shallop and explored inland, where they found some abandoned cornfields, forests that would provide timber, and a number of freshwater streams. Here was the site they had been seeking. The pilgrims spent much of their first winter living aboard the Mayflower. They had only two small boats, and winter weather slowed the unloading process even more. As some unloaded the ship, others began to work on a few small cabins, as well as a common house, where most would live and where goods could be stored. A fire that destroyed the thatched roof of a common house slowed the work even further. In that desolate place, not a scrap could afford to be lost, so everyone worked frantically to salvage the stored goods. While most of what was stored inside was saved, repairs could not be made because illness had begun to take a terrible toll. Deadliest of all was pneumonia, though at the time the pilgrims believed it was scurvy, caused by poor shelter and by the constant waiting in winter's cold waters to get from shallop to shore. By April, half the pilgrims had died, sometimes as many as two or three in a single day. A handful of people, including Captain Miles Standish, remained healthy, but in spite of their tireless efforts, the deaths continued. Because of their dwindling numbers, the pilgrims began to fear attacks by the Indians. But the Indians remained at a distance. Once they took some unguarded tools, but they would run off if approached by a pilgrim. Toward the middle of March, however, an Indian warrior strode boldly into Plymouth. He spoke a curious English that was hard for the pilgrims to understand, but they learned his name was Samoset. 
He was an Abnaki Sagamore, or chief, from what is now Maine, and he came on behalf of a tribe called the Poconoket, now called the Wampanoag. He spoke of another Indian named Squanto who had actually been to England. The pilgrims fed Samoset and sent him on his way with gifts. He soon returned with five men and the stolen tools. He announced that a great chief, Massasoit, was coming to visit the colony. The chief arrived several days later with a number of warriors, including Squanto. Food was shared, gifts were presented to the Indians, and a peace treaty was forged that endured for many years. When the Indians departed, Squanto stayed behind to act as an interpreter. Squanto revealed that when he returned to North America after his first journey to London, he had been kidnapped by a ship's captain who planned to sell him as a slave. But Squanto escaped back to England. Eventually, he was brought to New England, but he found that his tribe, the Patuxet, had been wiped out by a disease. He was the sole survivor. To the struggling community, Squanto proved to be far more than an interpreter. He taught the pilgrims how to harvest the natural bounty of the woods, where the best fishing waters were, and how to plant corn using fish as fertilizer. He served as a guide and as a go-between in buying furs from the Indians. Squanto remained at Plymouth until his death in 1622. On April 5th, 1621, the Mayflower returned to England. With the ship gone, the pilgrims would be wholly dependent on the land and the work of their own hands until the arrival of the next ship. The ship's captain offered to take anyone who wanted to return to England, but not a single pilgrim accepted his offer. That first spring, Governor John Carver died, yet for most of the warming weather brought general health and a sense of relief. Though they had lost half their company, the Plymouth Colony was surviving. Everywhere there were the sights and sounds of activity. The pilgrims applied old skills and quickly learned new ones. Boys watched over the fields, hunted, made wooden pegs to fashion beams, and helped build houses. Both boys and girls gathered mussels and clams, turned spits for roasting, and stuffed linen sacks with leaves, corn husks, or feathers to make mattresses. When time permitted, the children learned their ABCs and practiced their reading by studying the Bible and Psalter songbooks. More and more life took on a settled aspect. There were romances and weddings, births and deaths. The colony was beginning to be caught in the rhythm of village life. The sea yielded a bounty of fish and there were signs that the harvest would be good enough to get them through the coming winter. Even at the height of summer, the pilgrims had begun preparing for the winter that lay ahead. Corn was shucked and stored away, Fruits were dried and vegetables were pickled. Fish were dried and packed in salt, while meats were cured over smoky fires. In celebration of this plenty, plans were made to hold a harvest festival. This feast that we have come to call Thanksgiving would also celebrate the help the Indians had given the pilgrims. The food was plentiful. Though the barley and peas from seed brought from England had done poorly, they had their fill of beans, corn, and squash. There was cod and sea bass, which were grilled or served in stews, along with eels, lobsters, mussels, and clams. There were pumpkin pudding and skillet breads of cornmeal, as well as wild grapes and crab apples, dried strawberries and gooseberries. To supplement the harvest, the colony's new governor, William Bradford, sent some men to hunt ducks, geese, and wild turkeys. For three days, the pilgrims feasted. The children played games. The men had contests to test their skill with a musket. At the height of the festivities, Chief Massasoit arrived with 90 men, women, and children. A few of the men left briefly and returned with five deer, which were added to the feast. All the while, the colony was filled with chatter and laughter. This first Thanksgiving reminded the pilgrims of all they had to be thankful for and made them confident that their settlement would endure. Their Indian guests left with pledges of friendship and peace, a peace that lasted many years until the growth of the colonies created tensions between the two groups. The winter that followed was harsh, but not as difficult as the first winter had been. Another ship arrived bringing pigs as well as a few new settlers who had no supplies of their own. But hard work and a willingness to share brought everyone through the winter. When spring came, it was clearer than ever that the Plymouth Colony would indeed endure. In the days that followed, ships arriving from England brought necessities, such as clothes, shoes, tools, and muskets, as well as cloth, knives, beads, rugs, and trinkets 
to trade with the Indians. Small luxuries such as sugar, cheese, and spices also arrived. Later, cattle were sent. In return, the pilgrims sent back cargoes of lumber, salt fish, and corn. The adventure begun by a small group of brave men and women had developed into something greater than any of them could have imagined. The pilgrims had weathered illness, privation, and danger of every kind. Plymouth Colony had taken root. In time, its children would become known as New Englanders and Americans, and the seedling colony would blossom and bear extraordinary fruit. I hope you enjoyed this reading of N.C. Wyeth's Pilgrims. Texts by Robert Sansucci. And everyone, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, whether you're in the United States or not. Thank you for your support.